This is an interview with Tuesday Teal on Thursday, March 11th, 2021 by Nick Bertel. Now, Tuesday, can you give me an introduction on yourself? Yes, I can, Nick. So my name is Tuesday Teal, and um, I'm from Portland, Oregon. I was born and raised in Portland and in the Portland music scene. Um, I am a musician. I play the drums as well as um, I sing as well. Um, Right now, I am not in a current project, but I've been playing music since I was seven years old. So I've been I've been a drummer for a really long time. Right now, I'm currently a photographer. I'm a hairdresser. I am a seamstress, um, and I'm also a concert promoter with my partner. So I have a few different, you know, interests and and things I like to do. I think of myself as an artist. Try to apply myself to different mediums all the time. Now, can you tell me about getting your first camera? So my first camera, like you were saying, I was going to have this question. So I was very excited and I looked up my first camera ever. Now, I think this was my first camera ever because I was this little that it might have been, there might have been a camera before this. It might have been a disposable or something before this. I'm not sure. But the one that I remember as my first camera ever was a pink Barbie camera that was a Polaroid. It was a pink Polaroid Barbie camera that had flowers and it had like a big giant pink flower on the center of it. Now, did you take any sort of classes or study from any books to improve your talents as a photographer? Yes. So my photography, like it started when I was really little. I just liked being behind the camera. Um, My parents are both hairdressers and so I grew up in the beauty industry and I would be on set at a lot of photo shoots as a child, like as a little, little girl, so, like sometimes it would be my job to make sure that like, you know, the model wasn't exposed in some way so that they could check it before because they were still using film. And so there was a lot of time that I was behind the camera and just watching photo shoots happen. So as I started to get older, I started to want to kind of direct it more, you know, and I would, I started getting more creative and into it even more. And Luckily, the people around me at that time were photographers that were really accepting about it. You know, they were like, sure, the five-year-old can lead this shoot. Okay, like, let's try that, you know, until she's bored and then I'll go play, you know. And that's kind of how it started. Like, I had all of these awesome mentors in photography and in a completely different type of photography that I do now, which I think is very interesting because I started out doing something that was a lot more about high fashion photography in the studio and all about kind of, you know, magazine and marketing, like, like really focused on like selling, selling, selling anything. Whereas now I focus so much more, at least for me, I think about it as documenting what I'm seeing. And as I'm experiencing moments, capturing those moments, Um, So it comes from a little bit of a different place and started with something totally different. You know, it kind of like went this weird circle. (laughs) Can you tell me about some of the camera equipment you like to use at concerts now? Yes, yes. Oh, and and your question, I totally understand. Um, So for me, I started shooting uh, black and white darkroom photography in school. That's the the first time I like took a lesson in in school at all. I was a a freshman in high school taking darkroom class and I had to petition all of my teachers so that I could get into the class because you had to be a sophomore to take it. And I knew that I like, this is what I do. Like I already knew by then. And so I had to have all my other teachers and like the guidance counselor even sign something so that I could go into this, into the darkroom class. Um, And when I started doing darkroom photography, I absolutely loved it. I mean, I just totally gravitated to it so quickly. And I love to shoot film, even now. I have a darkroom, like, the equipment all up in my attic right now, just, like, waiting for me to have a space that I can pull it all out and start enlarging photos. So that's, like, on my list of to-dos. But as far as, like, right now goes, like, when I shoot a concert, let's say before COVID, I would just bring, I have a Fujifilm X100S, which is a really small bodied camera, but it is really powerful. And um, I have the upgrade as well where, you know, it's really nice to have lenses and it's nice to be able to change. And when I bring lenses, I have a fantastic time, like switching it up and trying to 
at different angles and use those lenses. But for me, the equipment is so much more important. It's things like I have to have um, my eye contacts in because if I wear my glasses, I will get smacked in the face with my camera. <laughs> I also have many, many, many times been having way too much fun at a show while shooting and my glasses just fly off my face because it gets sweaty, which is a little bit embarrassing, but very, very possible. So prepare yourself for that. And if you wear contacts, you know, have them in or just have like some kind of like chain around your glasses, you know, so that you can prepare. I do that while I play drugs as well, just because sometimes, you know, you get excited and your flip and then your glasses are gone. <laughs> the other things that are important for me when I'm shooting at a show are um, I have fancy earplugs that I keep on a keychain and all of these things go like fit into my, my vest like really well. So I have one vest. That is like, you know, my go-to vest because I can wear a vest with anything. So I have it big enough that I can fit like a couple of extra, like my little cassette thing that has um, SD cards in it. And then I have my fancy earplugs. And then I have like a couple of dollars in case I need to get some water or something. You know what I mean? Like I keep a couple dollars of cash so that I'm prepared. And usually I also really try to make sure that I have like my press badge um, at least like somewhere that it's already ready to be taken out because a lot of times what happens is they just believe you like they they believe that you have one it's more of just like okay now I gotta like go through all my stuff like go through all this thing when like no I'm trying to like get somewhere and do something <laughs> like it has to be efficient and like at some point you just need to like know the people at the venues to be able to be like hi hello remember when I showed you this earlier I don't need to show you more right you know just making a relationship with those people the other thing that I really really think is important for me when I'm shooting is um my vest is just a little bit big, but it, what's nice about it is it because my camera is so small, in some situations, I can actually cover my camera. Like, if, okay, like I have to walk through the pit or something. You know, you have to walk through a really, like, a lot of people moving around, and I'm holding sensitive equipment. I just stick it into my vest, close my vest, and walk through. <laughs> That's that's how that's how I do it. I just kind of like duck and cover like a turtle or something and um, get to where I'm trying to go. You know, like a lot of the people like are understanding, you know, of course, it's it's your risk. So it's kind of like you have to use your equipment how you use your equipment. And I am rough with my equipment. I'm not good about it. I won't deny it. Like I it should be better. I should be really on it. But you know what? I'm not because that's not how I make art. Like. I, like, you know, throw, like, hold the camera up as high as I can and take a picture, you know, trying to get the shot. And a lot of times there is a lot of thought going into the lighting and things like that. But I can't deny that it's not magic because the moment, you know, the moment is what it's about. And it's that I pushed that, I pushed it, you know. So I have to um, do whatever I can in my ability to have the guts to, like, be there, <laughs> And fully en enjoy it, you know? Like, I feel like I take better pictures when I'm having fun. <laughs> so that's part of the equipment, is to enjoy it, I guess. You know, like being there. <laughs> there's, there's two other things that I wrote down that are, like, you know, funny, but also totally helpful for other people shooting. At least, you know, for people that you're trying to shoot concert photography, right? So for me, I have um, a problem losing my lens caps. Now, now, again, you know, this is because I'm really rough on my stuff and I'm going on tours and I'm traveling and, like, if you lose a lens cap and then you are, like, stuffed into a tour van and, like, you're just not going to find it. Like, that is totally realistic that, like, you're just screwed, especially if it's the beginning of the trip. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Like, that could be, like, devastating. You know, every single picture you could have a scratched lens for, like, not good. So I found some hacks that make it so that I don't, like completely destroy all of my things. Um, I bought extra lens caps. That's one thing. And I have them for like, they all fit, they all fit my lenses, you know? Um, so I can just in case like, Oh, I lost one again. Like it'll never turn up. It's like bobby pins or socks that, you know, they just disappear. <laughs> and the other thing that I have besides just like a plethora of extras is I started using um, koozies, like the beer koozies. 
I cover the end of the lens with a little beer koozie because every brand, all of my, all the bands I see have band koozies. It gives me an excuse to buy more merch. And it also is really fun to be able to just like, I could just pop a little koozie on the end of it. If I, there's already a lens cap on there, perfect. It's even more safe and protected, but it's just like a handy, handy little device that for me, if you're in a pinch, that's going to be a really important thing, <laughs> especially on the road. The other thing that I have is I have a uh, a really distinct camera strap that I put patches on, and this camera strap has more than one locking mechanism onto the camera. So essentially, it's like when you're playing music and you have strap locks so that your instrument, like, there's no way. Like, it would have, you have to be really, really hard for that to come to detach itself from your camera. That's what I try to do is I try to have the most tough one I can because I don't know something happens and I drop it and like then it releases from the strap that would be devastating my whole equipment would be gone I need to have something that could like lift my weight you know <laughs> like I need it to be super duper strong so I, tr- I have I have more than one little loop on there on either side of my camera so that I am totally confident in it you know and I have the the ability to really like go for it and like bring that into the <laughs> into the fire with me. <laughs> now, how did you get involved with the Portland music scene? When I was seven years old, I started playing music. I started playing drums. Um, and I was born, you know, I was born in Portland. And my parents are both listened to music and grew up as punk rockers. Um, so what happened, as I started to evolve my, like, music, you know, what we go through, like, our music path, um, I started playing music really early and in bands. So I, I started taking lessons at the school of rock when I was a kid and I was probably eight years old. And I did that till I was like 15. And by then I'd already been in multiple bands. So then I was learning to play harder stuff. And that's when I really started to like get really, really excited because that's when I found my, you know, that's when I found like motorhead. So I, you know, it was like the first things that I learned how to play that made me feel like, like a badass, you know, like made me feel like, um, the people that also wanted to play stuff like that were my people. And so that's when it kind of started to take its shape and kind of evolve. I played music all the way through high school and through everything. And when I went to beauty school, I uh, lived in Utah. And when I got home from Utah, I had already been photographing bands while I was in Utah, just as like, I didn't have a drum kit while I was at school. So I would go and photograph bands because it was really fun. And it made me feel like I was connected, even though I couldn't physically play in a band because I didn't have a kit there. And so as I, as I continued and as I started to get better at it, I went to, um, I got home from school and a lot of my friends were now in bands as well. So that's when I kind of, you know, that's when some of my friends started to like adapt and like they were playing music, which before I had left for school, they weren't really like, there wasn't that many bands happening um, that were my age. You know, I was like 16 and 17. So coming back and being 18 years old and 19, I had completely finished school and I could have, you know, adults, I could go to these concerts and have like adult conversations with the musicians. And it wasn't like little kids anymore. You know, it was more like they had the goal and wanted to play more shows. And for me, it was, you know, how can I help facilitate that as well as where is this show? I wanted, like, I had like a list in my pocket every single day of what shows were going on and how many I could get to. Like, it was like the goal of like, what can I see? You know, like, I want to, I want to see it all. I want to hear all of my friends' fans. I want to support them as much as I can, as well as, you know, I want to play those shows. Kind of navigating, you know, who was booking, who wasn't booking. And, that's when that's when I met my partner, Christopher. Chris Nukes. Everybody calls him different things, but Christopher's what I call him. He's Chris to everybody else. So when I met him, I was 18, and I had just got back from school. And I met him um, through the Rock Block, which is where a bunch of bands came from in Portland. Like, tons of different bands lived on this one street. And so everybody kind of started there and then in like on a weekend you'd all start at the house and then we'd all like okay are you going to go to this one are you going to go to this one and it was like a big like are we going to take one car like 
it was like a caravan of people going out all the time. And, you know, this was before I could get into bars. So like, it would even be like, okay, can I sneak in? (laughs) Can I like sit outside with my friends and like, can I still hear it? (laughs) You know, like we had to like be sneaky about it. And Christopher started to uh, book more shows and because of him wanting to advance himself in booking, I kind of also helped facilitate that by expressing to him, you know, like my ideas of different venues and, you know, just, we, we work together. Like we were, we're partners still. And we, we, we kind of um, share those responsibilities when it comes to like the shows that we put on now. And it's so funny when we first met, we were going to all these shows and I had just met him. I went to, I went to a few shows and I'm like, what the heck? Like this dude is here again thinking of Christopher and I was telling my friends this and they were like well go talk to him like like you met him right like not a big deal and I was like okay so I went up to him and I was like are you like following me like there's been like a bunch of shows that you've been at and I've been at and he's like these are my shows and then I was the jerk and then I was totally the jerk because it seemed like I was following him and didn't know and so it was really funny but we had so many so many shows that we put on and so many shows that we got to go to and now looking back and it's like COVID has happened. I think that like, I feel so grateful, like so insanely grateful and thankful and like just astonished, like by how many shows I've seen and how much fun I've had at these shows. It didn't even have to be a big deal. It like all of the little cover shows that like were just ridiculous, like drunken messes for everybody was like some of the highest highlights that we will ever remember. And I am so, so happy that I got to experience those and I got to capture pictures of them. Like I got to capture these awesome pictures of my friends having the best time they've ever had. And we don't know when we're going to have that again. Like that's such a beautiful thing to me. And because we're part of the community and we get to like put shows on all the time, of course I can't wait to have more shows, but I have the pictures, you know, I have the pictures and I have, I still have the people. Like I still have like those people that I can be like, do you remember that? You know, like, do you, are you still in pain from falling off the stage? Like I can, I can remember all of these things and I can't wait to see their faces again. I can't wait to see them, you know, feeling that way and having that like group energy again that our community has. Like Portland has a fantastic music scene and honestly, like, the heavy metal music scene in in the world is such an amazing community that I think it's universal. Every time we travel, I feel that. And those friends don't leave you. <laughs> they just they just haven't been, you haven't seen them because we haven't been at shows. Like if everybody's all dispersed, but they're still there, you know. And I I I love the community part of it. That part's really important to me. Now, what three festivals did you enjoy shooting for? the most in the Pacific Northwest? So in the Pacific Northwest, we have a few different ones that are some of like, like, you know, that are, that I've had a really good time shooting. And there's been other ones that I just, I didn't shoot because I was enjoying too much. <laughs> like, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a festival that I was shooting. It was one that I was just attending, you know? And of course, sometimes I take pictures at those, but of the ones that I've actually like, that I shot and like, put myself to work that day for was um, our festival that we've had four years of uh, Salmon Fest. Um, And then I've also done, I've also shot Black Circle Fest, which was really, really fun. I loved Black Circle Fest. I hope that it will continue after all this. And then another one is Hail Santa Fest, which is one of my absolute favorites. Um, It's so much fun. And if you guys haven't heard of Hail Santa, like, please look it up. It is so much fun. There are costumes. It is like, It is the most fun, and I love that it's, like, themed around Christmas and, like, Krampus and, like, everyone is encouraged to dress up, and it just makes the whole holiday, like, so much fun. And it's like a reunion because you get to see everybody, and it's in Seattle, and it's a total blast. (laughs) What kinds of things are you shooting now with the diminished amount of live concerts due to the virus? So right now, this is a good question because, of course, I'm not – I'm not shooting concerts right now because there are no concerts. I'm, I'm, there's no concerts to miss, I guess. Um, but right now, really what's going on is I am working on a project where I am looking through all of my photos as much as I can 
And, um, you know, I'm putting together a project, Nick. I have a book, which I'm really, really excited about because this is something that, you know, happened and it's important to document these things. For me, for me, this is all about um, showing what I've seen. It's not necessarily, you know, trying to sell these images or something like that. It's just trying to, just putting out there the things that I've seen, <laughs> which for me was valuable. And that's that's all I can do is just show the cool stuff that I got to see so that other people can see it. Like right now for like photographing like constantly, um, you know, during the day and during my work week and stuff, I, I have an embroidery business and I'm a seamstress. So I've been photographing a lot of my my work and my patches that I make and my masks that I make. That's what I've been doing a lot of shooting. But I I really bring my camera like everywhere I go. I document my life. I document the things that I see and my friends and my puppies and my family. And so the whole time, you know, if I if we're at the skate park or if we're, you know, I don't know, if we're down at the skate shop that my partner works at, like I will document that. We we attended a few um big skate protests this year and I got to document those and all of the pictures that I look back at have like a little bit of magic in them. You know, it doesn't matter what they're of. For me, it's about that moment and those people, you know, and trying to capture something that I know and can feel (laughs) into something that other people can feel just by looking at it and maybe not knowing the context, you know, so it's adaptable. Like I shoot my art and I shoot the things I've made and then I shoot wherever I am. So there has been a lot of the skate park and there has been a lot of, you know, my house and my own environment and a lot of selfies and things like that, that are just the way I can express myself while being inside and isolated like everybody is, you know? Now, can you tell me what it was like traveling through Japan and I think China as well for you to uh, shoot photography? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I can tell you, I can tell you that it was, the most amazing thing that I've ever done. Um, we got to go to Asia twice. So we went to Japan um, the first time. And when we went to Japan the first time, we went to Osaka. And then we traveled over to Tokyo. Uh, and that was for the Osaka Sud Death Fest the first year that we went. Um, and the second time that we went, we got to go to China as well. How we did that was we, we got these crazy tickets through, I don't even remember the website. So I should because I was the tour manager for both of these tours. <laughs> but I can't remember it right now. But it was we, how we did it was we all saved over $1,000 by driving to Canada from Portland and then flying from Canada to China and then to Japan, which if anybody doesn't know, that is like completely like missing Japan and then flying back to Japan. <laughs> like it, it was such a crazy travel experience. And we parked our van in the Canada airport. Like it was just totally insane. But it ended up saving us a ton of money and it made it doable for all of these people. You know, there are six of us total. Um, it was me and petrification. And then we also had our friends up there with us. Um, the first time we had a band from Seattle called Drawn and Quartered, which they were such fun, hilarious travel companions, super, super loud, super hilarious, like literally like they never stopped giggling the entire time we were there. Like they just giggled the whole way, which I was very amused by. Um, and the second time we traveled, we went with um, we went with some of our other friends from the Northwest as well. And, you know, every time we go we have like these really, really cool experiences. And this time was with the band called Oxygen Destroyer. And they are, um, all of their theme is, is related to Godzilla and uh, history of Godzilla and other monsters like that. So it was super perfect to bring them to, to Japan with us because that is the land of Godzilla and everybody went crazy for it. And these dudes have not been treated like, total rock stars before until this and people were losing it. They were like, Oh my God, I love your band. And I just absolutely loved watching that because they totally deserve it. Their band is awesome, but it's just cool. when like, you get to see this kind of like, you know, there's like, there's like fan, they, they have fans, you know? And like, I want them to have fans. <laughs> like It's just such a fun thing. It was so much, so much fun. And uh, on that trip, that second, the second time that we went with oxygen destroyer, there was 10 people with us. And um, 
So it was their band and our band and then me as the extra. And it was so much fun. There was some crazy stuff going on while we were there, though. It was, there was a Takasa Death Fest. And when we got in, they, we saw like on our phones started beeping and it was saying how there was going to be a typhoon. So while we were in Japan for this trip, we were there for a typhoon. And I had no idea going into it. I mean, it just didn't even, they didn't like tell us when we were getting on the airplane, like, hey, you're flying into a typhoon. Are you sure you want to go? And of course, that was not even a question. Of course we were going. We're going to go. We're, we were already there. That, when we found out about it, we were already there. There was no question. A lot of the other bands there, excuse me, were were nervous and they were kind of like, you know, trying to change their flight so that they could get out before the typhoon, which I do, that's realistic, but it would not have worked with our schedule. Our schedules were laid out for their shows that it was just, it was completely in the middle of it. Like we had extra days because we wanted to travel and we had just the way that it was planned. There was absolutely no way that we could have gone. They would have, you know, not been able to play their shows at all. And that's just not something that you're willing to do at like no way. <laughs> So in our minds, we were like, we're in it. If this is how we go, we're cool with it. Like, if this is it, and this is like, you know, the biggest typhoon ever, and we are going to be destroyed, like, we better make the most of it. Like, it's it's going to be a good time. Like, and honestly, it was the most life-changing show that I've ever been to. We went to a show, and Petrification played the night of the typhoon. So there was literally like the eye of the storm happening outside of this basement. And then the whole, the whole, everything is chaos. I can't believe that the power stayed on. Like you could hear the wind shaking and like there was people there. Like it wasn't like there was like six people there. There was like 40 people there still. And of course that was less than the previous night, you know, and the night after that, but they played secondary shows. So it wasn't like it was their only set. And it was amazing. Like, it was so cool, the kinds of people that showed up. Because all the people that came to the show that night were like, you know what, if I'm going to die, this is how I want to die. Which, that kind of energy, I have never experienced before. It was absolutely awesome. People, I mean, it was like, you know, an end of the world party or something. Like, it was just like, maybe we'll get home, maybe we won't. Like, we're here now, this is amazing. Like... We're all safe right this second. You know, like, it was just, it was absolutely awesome. We had to, we had to run the gear from our little apartment, which was two blocks away, like, right when the eye of the storm happened, because the rain stopped during then. So we had to run the gear back right when it happened. Like, we had, like, we had probably, like, six minutes or something to run all of the guitars and the merch and stuff back to the house so that it didn't get completely drenched in this, like, crazy downpour. And it ended up being totally fine. We were super safe in our apartment. Like, there was a lot of devastation from this hurt, from this typhoon. But, um, you know, where we were was safe. And so we felt super grateful because there was other big buildings around us. And the um, Airbnb that we were staying at was super kind. They came and, like, checked on us to make sure. And they were like hey, if anything happens, like, you know, let us know. And we tried to just, like, keep our calm and, like, chill out as much as possible. But being the tour manager of that, I definitely still had to, you know, make sure that, like, we had the necessary things. Like, we had toilet paper, you know. I delegated, and right when we heard about the typhoon, I made sure that, you know, I had things in place and that everybody had, like, taken photos of their IDs and their passports in case you know, and that I had a list of their emergency contacts because I don't know what is going to happen. That's just my job as a tour manager is to just ensure that like, if something happens, I know who to call, you know, or if there's going to be um, no show tonight, what are we going to do to help the venue stay open? You know, things like that. Things like just like making sure that the people who are just sitting here, not having anything to do, aren't freaking out that they have jobs. Because if you have a job to do, you can't freak out. It just doesn't work. (laughs) What were some of your favorite sites you visited going through Japan and China? And can you speak about some of your favorite souvenirs you picked up? Yes, I can. So when we were in Japan, um, we got to see so many, so many cool shrines. I mean, Japan is full of shrines. Like around every single corner, I felt like there was a shrine, which was amazing because I wanted to read all of the information and I got my Google Translate out. And I had to, like, figure, you know, I had to, like, get my picture and, like, make sure and then get the band's picture so that we could all 
we we enjoyed it so much. We love the history of Japan. And while we were there, we got to see, um, we were, were stayed by the Thunder Gate, like both times we were there, which is just beautiful and tons of tourists. But because there was a typhoon the second time, we got some really, really cool pictures near there where there really wasn't very many tourists, which I thought was awesome. Um, you know, just another little bonus. We also, Christopher and I, not the whole band, they, they were they were off doing other things, but um, we went to the Digital Art Museum, which is amazing. I was completely blown away. It was on my list of things to do the first time we went, and we didn't get to go. So then the second time, I was like, okay, we are actually going to do it. And we, like, voyaged out there, which is a little bit of a a little bit of a train ride and um you have to go onto this island um to get there but it was amazing this digital art museum is so cool it's holograms um they have a digital waterfall that you can like put your hand on the wall and the water moves around your hand like it was amazing we spent we spent like seven hours there and we hadn't eaten before we went in and we still were like we could stay a little bit longer like we were having way too much fun there's like a giant trampoline that you can like, you can like jump on and it like makes planets explode. And like, it was just so, so cool. Like absolutely amazing. Like totally um, mind boggling and inspiring <laughs> on so many different levels. Um, one of the other things that we went to in Japan was uh, we got to ride bikes. We got to ride bikes um, on the beach, like near the bamboo forest, which was really, really beautiful. That's where we we rented bikes as a group and the dudes did a, uh, an interview, um, with Stentrial over there. They did a, they did an interview on the beach where there was a bunch of birds trying to like attack them while they were doing the interview. It was hilarious. It was so crazy. These, they were, they were huge birds. I've never seen anything like it. And they were like little kids messing with the birds. It was crazy. Like you could totally lose a digit. Like they were, they were coming to get you if you had something in your hand for them to take. It was, they were falcons, you know? So it was like crazy birds, way bigger than the birds we have here. And we also went to the, uh, we went to a skate park that was on top of the Diver City Mall. That was really cool. Like it was completely up in the sky, like totally beautiful. And it had a great view. And then we also went to one that was, farther out that's called the axis skate park that was really amazing um we, we did that after the typhoon and we got to see like a little bit of how you know they were cleaning up and stuff like that because there was like a lot of uh roads that got like washed out and like some mudslides so we actually got to like see a little bit of that which i thought was really cool because you know in tokyo there really wasn't too much damage it was mostly just like windows on really big streets and things that got toppled over and like branches now, but you know, on in different areas where there weren't all these big buildings to protect from the wind, it was completely different story. I mean, it was like they looked totally different. Like it looked, it, it there was just a lot more wreckage um, and water disbursement. You know, like it wasn't as irrigated. So it was, it was definitely really cool to see though. And they they cleaned up very quickly. And I, I think that they did a great job with how they did that. Um, one of the other places that we got to go, which I was super, super excited about, and I didn't do it the first time, so I had to do it the second time, was I went to a hedgehog cafe, <laughs> and I got a tea, and I got to play with a little baby hedgehog, and then I also went to the owl cafe, and I was very, very scared. I didn't know <laughs> that I had a fear, and then I met an owl, and I was scared of it. <laughs> And it was really amazing, though. I mean, they're just such huge birds that, like, when you're staring in the face of this bird, you're just like, this thing could just, like, my eyeball in, like, one second. Like, no problem. You know, cut off your finger. I don't know. Like, I was totally scared. It was very well-mannered, and no one else was scared, but I was freaked. So I'm sure it was eyeing me even more. We also went to, um, when we were in China, we also went to uh, the Great Wall, which we were in China for a layover for like like a little bit over something like 12 hours or something, maybe a little bit longer than that. And essentially, we got on the plane one day, got off the plane in China, went to our hotel, we were sleeping, and then we went back to the airport and we were supposed to get on the plane at like three o'clock in the afternoon. So what we did, Christopher and I, is we, we, we um, looked it up beforehand and we found a a tour guide that picks you up from your airport it's called it's called 
like layover tours in case you're ever traveling and like it's an option. Um, it was amazing. It was so cool. They picked us up at the airport or they picked us up at the hotel super, super early in the morning. Like the whole band was still asleep and um, drove us out to the Great Wall of China. We got to go look around. It was like we had to like run up there pretty much, like run up, run up to the Great Wall and then run down essentially, um, which it was really, really cold and I had no idea and I did not have a coat, but it was still super fun. And it's gigantic. I mean, it's huge. Like people don't talk about how huge it is and how it's actually like riding the back of a mountaintop. Like it's huge. Like you have to take like a ski lift almost to get up there. It was amazing. It was so amazing. And I cannot believe that I got to do that. I cannot believe that because of music and because of doing what we care about got us to a point where we got to see something like that. And we had like the luck to do it in the year before COVID. Like we, we did this months, maybe three months before COVID happened. We were in China during that. So, I mean, it's just, it's crazy to think about now because I can't like, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful that we got to do that. And that, you know, as a group, we got to experience all these things of traveling and like, you know, there's, there's so many things that we saw that we will never see again. One of the craziest things besides the typhoon, the first time we went to Japan, it was during Halloween and we decided that we were going to go, we were all going to go to this Halloween party. Was it in and Harajuku? The Halloween party that we had, Yes, it was. It was. It was ridiculous. And you're laughing. So it was the, the place that we had to go to get there was in Shibuya, like in Shibuya Station. <laughs> so I had no idea that this, they were like, it's going to be fun. Let's go. And I was like, okay, guys, like the, the concert part of this is over. So my like work part of this tour management is over. Like now we're just going to have fun. We're all going to hang out together, right? Nobody has to be anywhere on time except to the airport. And so we're all hanging out and we're, Christopher and I are dressed as two giant babies because that's what you do on Halloween. And there are so many other people in costumes. I mean, thousands and thousands of other people. And we get off the train and I was like, you know, like this seems like it might not be a good idea. Like as we're getting closer, the stops, the, the train just gets more and more full, like so, so close together, like super claustrophobic close together. And as we're getting off at the Shibuya station, I was like, wait, Shibuya station is the busiest crossing in the world. It's the busiest intersection in the world on a regular day. And then the dudes are like, yeah, that's where the party is. And I was like, are you kidding me? Are you just trying to kill me? Like, is this, are you, is this actually the goal to just like, and then leave me there and I die? I don't know. Like some kind of like, like, tri- let's just, let's just leave her in Japan. <laughs> like, see what happens. It was insane. We had to hold, we, we had to daisy chain six people <laughs> all in a line <laughs> to try to get through just to like find a place of like where we could stop. Which wasn't a thing. You have to just, like, keep walking and keep walking because there were so many people. Like, it wasn't a party. It was just claustrophobia city. Like, it was insanity. And people really liked our costumes, so they kept, like, stopping us and be like, oh, babies! And we were like, ha, ha, please don't touch us. We were scared. Like, it was just way too close together. Like, you were touching other people on all sides of you, which would never happen now. It would never happen now. Like, that's not even an option anymore. But I cannot believe that we were there, essentially on accident, and we had a really good time after I was done freaking out. By the way, what is your favorite urban legend or ghost story you learned from living in Portland? Okay, so this one's a little bit, I mean, it's not just from living in Portland, but it is in Portland. So this one, again, is related to the Petrification Band. Um, This is what happened. The... The practice space that they use is called Portland Cement Company. And it's a really, really cool building. But this building is already kind of in a sketchy location. So it's down underneath a bunch of bridges and very close to the river. And it's in like an industrial part of town. So there's not like a lot of restaurants around there. It's all like, you know, big buildings, big like big concrete buildings and stuff. And the train tracks, like huge train tracks that are like very busy. Um, so it's like the perfect place for a practice space because it's like, you know, you can be loud and the trains aren't going to be mad about it. So essentially, 
this is the same place, this practice space is the same place that I did rock school at. And rock school is like an after school music program for kids. And um, while I was attending school of rock, rock school there, um, there was always like a little bit of an air that it was a little bit haunted. Like everybody kind of mentioned it. It's a very, very old building. And so even then as a kid, you know, we had heard ghost stories. Like we had heard these stories of this practice space and that, you know, if you were there practicing and there was no music, it was like pretty sketchy. But usually you're there's music because it's a practice space. And even with a bunch of kids there, there were people practicing in every room, you know, so it was very rarely silent. Now that it is no longer the space for like that school, it is just open practice phases. There are totally times when it is silent. And let me tell you, this place is so creepy, Nick. It is, it is so creepy. And they, it's not a little creepy inside. Like it's painted nicely and everything, but you go to the bathroom and if it's silent in that bathroom, I swear, like, it is just super, super weird. You can feel this energy. You can feel this, like, like the wind is super cold in there. Um, a few different people have come into, like, the, the garage door part of it at different times and, like, died. Like, people, like, homeless people have come inside trying to, like, seek warm warmth and then died and they found them. And that's just the ones that have happened in, the, in this, like, recent. So before that, when I was in School of Rock, there was a bunch of rumors that, you know, it was, like, the spirit of musician or something like that that, like, hated it to be silent. <laughs> but I have no idea about, you know, the true the true origin of this. But every time it gets quiet in there, I get so uncomfortable. And I can't, like, hang out. Like, I can't hang out in there if it's quiet. If there is music playing or if somebody is even just, like, you know, clanking away like in a room next door it's fine but as soon as it gets quiet I swear it is so scary there's like all these different like concrete stairs because it used to be a like a concrete facility um which I feel like concrete is already like kind of a spooky stone I don't know because people could be like enclosed in it or something you know they could just be like in the walls I don't know something crazy like that but it's just a really, really energetically charged building. And all of the members of Petrification have separately said that they have all felt weird stuff at this place. Like, this isn't just me. I can't you swear. Like, it's not just me. And they have said that when they've been there practicing by themselves at times, it's been even worse. Like, if you stop playing or something, it's almost like somebody's standing in the room with you. Now, Super creepy. <laughs> would you like to go back to any questions? I had something I wanted to say about um, when we saw we, we when we were in Japan, we saw the Great Wall and we saw coffins, and I'm not sure which one was heavier. <laughs> yes, we saw coffins. It was amazing. We saw them more than one time, and I lost my I lost my cool. We also saw Abigail. We saw a ton of amazing bands while we were in Japan, and I I couldn't keep it cool. Like I was I was trying to not be a fan girl, but I was like, oh my god! Like I I I lost it. <laughs> final words please you know I I like right now as far as photography I'm so excited to be looking back at all my old like all the pictures of the tours that I've been on and all of the the experiences with bands and all the like you know versions of bands that I kind of forgot about you know there's so many there's so there are people in these bands and you watch them grow as you go through these pictures and I think it's just really awesome to be able to look back on the faces of these people in the crowd and on the stage and be able to actually like feel it again even when we're not there um and that's brought me a lot a lot of happiness just when I'm going through them so I'm really excited to share the pictures as well as just I can't wait to shoot again I mean I really I'm always inspired being inspired has never been part of my creative issues for me it's more of where to focus instead of what to focus on because I can that that's not the hard part there are so many things I can always take a picture of something I can always find something that I think is interesting it's more of what story I want to tell where where is the important message here you know like what is the big thing that needs to come up and I think that remembering what our community is and holding on to those values um right now is really important because we're at a time where people want to kill it, you know, and 
I personally know that I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, I will help save as many venues as I possibly can. I will help save as many bands as I possibly can. Like, I know it's not over. It's just changing colors. You know, it's just, it's going to look a little bit different after this, but everything changes. Everything has changed. There's no time in our lives when we're like, oh, you know, it's exactly the same as it was. No big deal. No, like, that's not how it works. We're constantly evolving as people. Like, there will be challenges. This is just one of them. Like, as we grow, we can figure this out. Like, it's way too important of a thing, music and shows, to be to, to let it go away. Thank you very much. This has been an interview with Tuesday Teal on Thursday, March 11th, 2021, by Nick Perkel.